Donald Trump, a consummate swindler, habitually oversells his achievements. In the past, he did so after meeting with North Korea's Kim Jong un and after revamping NAFTA. He did it again after agreeing to a 90-day trade war truce with China's Xi Jinping at the Group of 20 summit in Argentina. National Security Advisor John Bolton has been advancing ridiculous claims that talks over the next three months will transform China's authoritarian character and alter the 5,000-year zero-old course of Chinese history. The reality is quite different. The upcoming negotiations between the world's two leading economies, even if they take place at all, after the arrest of a Huawei executive in Canada on a U.S. warrant, are what Americans call a nothing burger. While some adjustments to bilateral commercial relations could be made, they're bound to remain cosmetic. A comprehensive deal that the Trump administration is demanding won't work, and it won't work for both sides. Start with China. Its rise into the economic big leagues parallels that of Japan several decades previously. Both countries benefited from the high level of discipline in their society, a determined, well-educated, plentiful and cheap workforce and a corporatist state run by a single party in which politicians were in league with their cronies in business. Both countries followed an export-led development model, running massive trade surpluses with the rest of the world, and most notably with the United States, while their own populations remained savers, not consumers. The trade surpluses were recycled, making Japan and China major suppliers of capital for the rest of the world. At the same time, perennial deficits on their capital account served to keep domestic currencies low, stimulating exports. Alarmed Westerners even used the same terminology to describe the danger these two countries pose, hell-bent on world domination, and planning ahead for centuries. In the 1980s, Washington became convinced that Japan was destined to replace the United States as the world's leading economy. That was, ironically, the exact moment when Japan entered a period of economic stagnation and social drift from which it is yet to recover. What underpinned Japan's decline is probably keeping China's leaders awake at night. Japan boasted a top-notch manufacturing and engineering infrastructure but it could not innovate on its own. Throughout the early post-World War II decades it was buying American parents which were languishing on the shelf and turning them into innovative products. Then came a two-pronged economic revolution in the United States. The new entrepreneurial spirit was unleashed and a financial system emerged to back budding entrepreneurs. Americans no longer only came up with innovative ideas but got the wherewithal to implement them, turning huge profits in the process. The rise of the American high-tech entrepreneur broadly parallels the economic decline of Japan. China is pretty much in the same boat, except two decades ago it didn't even have a modern manufacturing base. It had to build it from scratch by inviting foreign companies to invest in trading on its extremely cheap labor and lax environmental regulations. As far as innovation is concerned, not only is China finding it hard to innovate, but the global innovation establishment is now totally centered on Silicon Valley, American-run funds and the Nasdaq market. California towns around Stanford University are crawling with deep-pocketed foreigners looking to discover new Googles and inventors from every part of the world flock to California as well. Other tech centers in Israel, India and elsewhere act as feeders into this system. This is why almost all great global high-tech firms are American. If you want advanced technology you have to go to American companies, either to buy or, if you want to develop your own high-tech national champions as China does, to steal. Technology is what Marx called the means of production. As Marx correctly pointed out, those who control the means of production control the economy and earn all the profits. Without access to advanced technology, China is facing an unpalatable prospect of remaining a manufacturing appendix of the American empire. Unfortunately for China, it is a losing proposition. Since the high-tech revolution, manufacturing has become a race for the bottom. Technology now allows to locate even advanced production in low-wage countries in other parts of Asia and Africa, putting downward pressure on wages.
worse, robots and other advanced technology are eliminating the need for workers altogether. Production, but not the jobs, will eventually return close to consumer markets, leaving China holding the bag. Japan stagnated, but China, when faced with similar problems, may blow up. Since economic reforms began, the government in Beijing made a point of avoiding economic crises of any kind, pouring in money whenever there was a likelihood of an economic or financial downturn. But periodic recessions are healthy for the economy since they serve to eliminate excesses, bankrupt the imprudent and wipe the slot clean. Without such corrections China has become plagued by entrenched, inefficient players carrying huge debts and propped up by government subsidies. If the economy stops expanding, these problems are likely to come to the fore. And then there are social problems. In one generation, China moved several hundred million peasants into urban centers. In other countries, rapid urbanization always led to social turmoil. In China it has been swept under the carpet, so far. Finally, the one-child-per-family policy has created a problem that is similar to Japan's, i.e., an aging population, which is exacerbated by a shortage of women and younger age groups. China is a huge nation, with a massive standing army and a nuclear arsenal. Turmoil there is in no one's best interests. The United States is especially dependent on a stable, productive China that continues to manipulate its currency and run huge trade surpluses. Changing this equation would alter the underpinnings of the American economy, as well. Cheap Chinese goods keep the vast American underclass afloat. Shifting production to the U.S., as Trump is promising, would boost prices without necessarily creating many jobs, and certainly not highly paid jobs in the absence of strong trade unions. Chinese trade surpluses allow Americans to live well above their means, consuming more than they produce. China buys U.S. debt demanding very low interest rates on U.S. treasuries, which keeps U.S. interest rates low. Without its purchases, rates could shoot up. The Chinese are angry about the arrest of their business executive, and they believe Trump was playing she for a fool, but they are probably not going to make a huge deal of it. China's most likely course of action will be to stall, to stretch negotiations and to pretend to make concessions, while doing very little of substance. Either Trump will declare victory and leave everything as it is, or Beijing will simply outlast him. But this may be a mistake. There is a consensus in Washington that China needs to be contained. It may be the only policy objective shared by Trump's supporters and opponents. If it persists in its trade war, Washington may severely damage the Chinese economy. The danger then is that China, which has been steering clear of a close alliance with Putin, may be driven into Russia's arms. Found a spelling error? Let us know, highlight it, and press Ctrl-Enter.